time is 11 o'clock. Let's uh, begin. So first of all, uh, all of you completed the day number one quiz, so all of you got five out of five points on that. Uh, there was a question last night from Brianna regarding the, um, uh, the videos. And if I overheard it correctly, you still didn't get to work? No, I tried yeah. everything to say yes, but however I can't. It won't let me get past the screen with even with the MP4. It just breaks it. Hmm. I'm going to try it today here and maybe some of the internet connection. Yeah, and, and perhaps in uh, like static 75, we ran into some similar problems mm -hmm. like that. I know it actually kind of frustrated me. Um, and, uh, you know, I thought this summer when I was putting some, to get some stuff together for my book, so this is my book's website, and I have links here to all these videos uh, that I have recorded in the past uh, for, uh, for, for my book. And here's one of these web pages here. And what can happen is if you push play here, and then let's say uh, perhaps you try to fast forward, mm -hmm. That screws it all up, right. and unfortunately, the web browser uh, keeps a memory of where the last down point was, mm -hmm. down uh, uh, download point was, and you can never get past it. Mm -hmm. And it's been in my experience then when I was uh, I actually had to um, re recreate all these videos for my book over the summer. My experience was that. If you use like the private mode or the incognito mode of a browser, it should work. Or perhaps, what browsers did you try? I tried Chrome and Internet Explorer, okay. and I tried the incognito mode or private mode, whatever, and Google Chrome and nothing. Hmm. It still kept freezing for some time. Okay. Or maybe it was just the internet connection right here today. Yeah, I tried it. I tried it like for like five minutes because when I saw the email, it worked for me where I was for like five minutes. I don't know. I didn't really try beyond that because it seemed time. So yeah. You. you know, obviously, you know, and, and I know, and that that's the weird thing that, and then for my other classes, that when I then try it up here at school, no matter what, even if I stopped it in the past, it still works. Yeah, it yeah. works usually pretty well. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to try to watch it today. I'm okay. Um, I mean, it's, obviously, it's just very disappointing that it happens, and especially, you know, these these videos are are, are so large. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I've looked in last week. I looked in some ways to try to um, some initial ways to try to make them smaller, so that you won't necessarily be tempted to, you know, fast forward to a place where the video hasn't downloaded yet. Uh, but so far, I have not been successful, mm -hmm. and I, I don't know why. The videos have to be so large. Um, um, it, the, the software I'm using, Camtasia Studio, um, this, this, the, the, the newest version I'm using, for some reason, really wants to make the videos large, where in the past they were maybe at most half the size. Mm -hmm. It's the same stuff mm -hmm. that's being recorded. So I, I, I don't understand why it's, why it's doing that. Uh, try, try again. If you still have problems, let me know. I, I, I have potentially some ideas uh, to try to solve these problems. Okay, so uh, let's see. Let's take a look at the schedule here. So today we will continue with the Monte Carlo simulation stuff. Uh, originally, I was going to give out assignment number one today, but we didn't get as far last Thursday as I had anticipated, so I decided to move assignment number one uh, back to Thursday. Uh, the assignment's essentially written. I just want to do one last read-through. Um, and so uh, maybe tonight, uh, maybe uh, by, by, by uh, for sure tomorrow I will post it. Um, and, and then also I'll put a post a message to the listener saying, hey, assignment number one's ready. Why don't you go download it so that you have a copy of it ready to go for class on Thursday. And then we'll, go over, we'll start going over it on Thursday. Are there any questions before we get going here? Okay. So what we're talking about Monte Carlo simulation with respect to uh, what statisticians need to know for statistical research. And so just to review a little bit here, you know, in statistical research, typically you have an, a particular estimator, a statistic, which how about we just call T. And what you want to do is examine some characteristics about this estimator. So these characteristics could be, you know, one of the following. You want to know the, the actual distribution for T. 
uh, you want to know, well, uh, what's the mean? What, what's, how about we put this? What's the expected value of t? You know, what's the variance of t as well? And, uh, you know, in, in more complicated problems, you know, you're not going to be able to come up with closed form expressions for exactly what the expected value of t is or what exactly the distribution is. You know, perhaps one could do some approximations, such as maybe find the asymptotic distribution of t. Also, you get the mean and the variance associated with that. But again, that's for the one sample size that you'll never have, infinity. Um, and, uh, and so you might be interested, well, let's say if I have a sample size of 25. Well, what, what would I expect t to be? What, would I, what, which, which, what is the distribution itself? It doesn't necessarily have to be a named distribution. Um, and so that's what Monte Carlo simulation allows you to evaluate. And so in a Monte Carlo simulation setting, what you're going to do is you're going to have some data simulation mechanism. And you're going to have T1, T2 down to, and we said uh, we're going to have R simulations. So we're going to do, limit, let's say, R simulated data sets. And you're going to have all the way down to T sub R. And then using these guys here, what you're going to try to do is estimate these characteristics. As long as R is large, we know that these estimates should be good. Okay. Uh, in particular, when we were talking about the distribution here, we, we brought up something called the EDF. Does anyone remember what that stands for? Yeah, the empirical distribution function. And we denote this by uh, F hat. Its purpose is to estimate the cumulative distribution function, or CDF. Um, and so we're going to be talking about how R estimates then the EDF shortly. Uh, I guess one last thing before we move on. So, you know, if I want to estimate then this expected value of T, the way that I do it is I simply take the average of all the T's that are in my uh, sample. I'm sorry, in my uh, simulations that I'm doing. And um, in fact, if I wanted to do some kind of function of t, let's call it g of t, I could do that as well. Again, as long as r is large, we know by the weak law large numbers that this is going to be a good estimate. And that's what drives a lot of the stuff that we do with the Monte Carlo simulation. OK. So what we're going to uh, start now doing in this Monte Carlo simulation section is we're going to look at four main uses of Monte Carlo simulation in the statistical research setting. Uh, let's take a look at this here. We are on page five. Um, so we're going to talk about unbiased estimators. Now, in stat 880, well, stat even eight, no, stat 883. You know, you have some kind of statistic. We, again, we can call it, oops, don't really use that color. We call it, again, the statistic T. And in the simple settings that you will look at in stat um, 883, you could actually do some by hand derivations that the expected value of T is equal to theta. And if that occurs, you have, yes, unbiased estimate. That's good. It obviously makes sense that. You, know, you want to have unbiases. Um, but oftentimes, you're not going to be able to do a, a simple deprivation like that. That's where Monte Carlo simulation then comes in handy. So what we want to do it, then determine is, is, is to determine, well, is t, let's say, um, I'm sorry, is expected value of t approximately equal to theta? where theta is the, the parameter, again, that you want to estimate. Again, you're not going to be able to actually get expected value of t itself. So what you're going to do is, uh, again, approximate it through then uh, simulation. Okay. And, you know, you're never going to be in a, in, a, in a Monte Carlo simulation setting such as this. You're never, ever going to be able to tell exactly, is T an unbiased estimator? 
because of that simulation variability in the end. Okay? You're never ever going to be able to tell that exactly. So you have to be very careful then when you're writing a paper to make sure you word it in the right way. In a paper where you're using Monte Carlo simulation, I would never say, yes, my new estimator that I proposed, the builder estimator, is unbiased. I would never say that. Instead, what I would say is something like this, that the bias is approximately zero, or there's very little bias based upon my Monte Carlo simulations. Okay, so if you're in, interested in investigating the unbiasedness of an estimator, uh, typically what you're going to do in a paper is something like this, where you do maybe one set of simulations, maybe you know, R is equal to 500, let's say, so that would be one set of simulations where maybe your sample size is 25, you know, and you're simulating data from a certain distribution and, and you get other settings you have to worry about as well. Then, keeping all those same settings exactly the same, you go up to n equal 50. And you do the same kind of set of simulations there. And then calculate, and I'm doing this in a general sense by saying g of t rather than just necessarily t, and then calculate the average across all those simulations for n equal 25, and then also the same for n equal, 20, n equal 50, calculate the average of all those g of t's that you're getting. And then one of the following scenarios will occur. First, suppose that the average of the g of t's is close to theta, where theta again is what you're trying to estimate. Then there's evidence that g of t is an unbiased estimator of that parameter. I went say in a paper, and maybe I didn't say this as well as I should. Um, I would never say that, yes, this is an unbiased estimator. I would, again, as I was kind of mentioned before, I would say something like that, um, you know, perhaps the, uh, the bias is quite small. So if this happens, this first scenario, then great. This new estimator that you have proposed works like what you want. Okay. And you can use this estimator in practice for as low as sample sizes as perhaps what you had used in the Monte Carlo simulation. Of course, you can't necessarily say this would work for n equal 10, because you haven't done that yet. But if you're seeing this pattern at n equal 25, n equal 50, you, you, know, you would expect that for at least 20, a sample size of 25, everything's going to work out good for you. The second scenario then is, well, guess what? You know, this, this average of these g of t's is not close to theta. So then you do have a bias estimate. And maybe this occurs for all your, suppose it occurs for all your sample sizes that you're looking at. So you don't want to use that estimate. Hopefully, in a, again, a, a, a statistical research setting, hopefully uh, this happens for, let's say, a competing estimator that you want to compare your own estimator that you've developed uh, to. And then lastly, what maybe most often happens, uh, suppose that the average of the GFTs is not too close to theta for the smaller sample sizes, but as the sample size gets larger for these simulation sets, eventually this average is getting closer and closer and closer to theta, to a point where, yeah, it's just about theta. In that case, then, in a, in a paper, you can say, well, for a sufficient sample size, you know, my estimator is good. It works as I want it to. Okay, so let's take a look at an example then. The way I typically introduce examples is I'll say example in my notes. I'll give a, a, a title for the example where I will use this title, title then throughout, where I maybe come back to this example. And then in parentheses, I will put the actual program name that I'm using, uh, maybe also data sets and such. Uh, you can download this uh, program from my website. So let's look at a, a very simple estimator, simply the sample variance. Um, so t is my sample variance. And what I want to do is evaluate then, is this a good estimate, estimator of some population variance? Okay. Um, also, what we want to do is examine the distribution of the t's as well. 
Now, in your STAT 883 class, you know, uh, what did you learn about the distribution of stable variance? Excuse me? Uh, kind of chi squared, you know, like n minus 1 t over sigma <laughs> squared. That would be chi squared if what? <coughs> Has nothing to do with the sample size. Sigma, sigma, sigma squared. Well, yeah, sigma squared is known, yeah. It has nothing to do with the sample size. But there's one other very, very, very important property that you need to have hold for this to be chi squared. The underlying distribution of your data has to be? Oh, no. no. That's a big assumption. Okay? And you will see what happens when that's. Uh, it doesn't hold true. Not today. We won't get to that today, but we will eventually. Um, okay, so let's start off with the simplest case then, the one that you're used to, where your distribution is normal. So I'm going to let my y sub i's be iid for sample size up to 9. I'm going to set a particular mu to be 2.71, and my variance is 4.82. Let's look at how we can simulate the data in an efficient manner. Efficiency is often very important with Monte Carlo simulations because you're doing the same thing over and over and over again. And if you don't do it in an efficient way, that can make your Monte Carlo simulations take a very, very long time. Okay. So uh, over here, I'm just going to simply set my mu, set my sigma set my sample size and the number of simulations that I want to do, 500. I'll make this a little bigger as well. Okay. Now let's simulate our data. Remember I have IID random variables. I have sample size of 9. I'm going to do 500 simulations. I mean, I'm going to do 500 simulated, simulated data sets. So the most efficient way most efficient way to simulate my data is to do it all at once through using this little command here. R norm, of course, does uh, simulates uh, random. And notice for the first argument that says how many observations I want, I want 9 times 500, so 4,500. I set my mu, I set my sigma. Then I need to organize my simulated data in a particular way. So I decided to use a matrix structure where every row is a simulated one of my simulated data sets. So I'm going to have 500 rows and then nine columns. Let's go ahead and do this. So my first simulated data set, uh, y1 will be 3.5, y9 will be 3.79. Now, of course, I need to set a seed number. Why do I want to set a seed number? So I can reproduce my results. Okay? It's an essential part of, of the reproducibility of research to make sure that you can duplicate it whenever needed. But also, there will be times where um, you do a Monte Carlo simulation and you get some odd things occur. And let's say, for example, uh, my sample variance ended up being negative for some reason for one simulated data set. Well, I want to go back and evaluate what happened there. And maybe it was programming error. So by, by setting the C number so that you can reproduce the results, you can always go back and figure out exactly what, what, what was going on wrong. Uh, so the first row is my first simulated data set. Now, there are other ways that you might think would be better to, or I shouldn't I say better, but there might be other ways that you would have thought of to simulate the data. For example, maybe you would have wanted to do something like this. Maybe you use a for loop for R in 1 to capital R. Uh, y, let's say, Y sub R gets R norm N equal N some other stuff there. So that what you're doing is you're simulating the data sets one at a time in a for loop. Why would this maybe not be efficient? Because you have to, you have 
get so many loops to go through until we get all the Exactly. Notice I had to call R norm 500 times. Okay? And in, in terms of being efficient, this is, this is not. What you should always do is, if possible, simulate all your data all at once without a for loop. There are going to be set times where you can't do that. Okay? But especially when I have IID random variables, I don't need a for loop. Also, something that you should do is always simulate all your data up front first before you do any calculations at all. So all simulated data sets. That will also be more efficient, meaning, again, it will take less time. Of course, again, there are going to be times when you can't do that. And in fact, you might have to simulate one data set at a time and then also stick in your calculations right after that inside that for loop. Okay, so if I want my first then uh, estimate of, uh, of the variance, so this would be T1, it's 3.968 using the var uh, function. Okay, so I have a whole bunch of variances that I need to calculate. I need to calculate T500 different times. Here are two ways to do this. One way is to use the apply function, which I would imagine probably a lot of you have seen, but I won't be surprised if some of you have not. And apply is a, is a nice little function to use because it allows you to apply some other function uh, as many times essentially as you want, quickly. Uh, so all my simulated data is in y.sim. So the first argument, x, corresponds to what do you want to, what, what's your data? And I want to apply the function var to every row of my y.sim. So margin equal 1 corresponds to row. I would say margin equal 2 that corresponds to column. Not very intuitive, uh, but that's what it is if you look in the help documentation. So I'm going to apply the function var to every single row. An equivalent way in SAS would be, let's say, maybe to use, let's say, proc means uh, and say uh, you want variances and to use the by statement. So I'm going to put all my variances into t.all. So if I look at t.all, the head of it, my first six variances, t1 through t6, are shown there. There's them all. And you can see there's some variability across all 500 data sets. Well, let's find the mean. Because what would be nice is if this mean of these 500 um, t's is close to sigma squared. The mean is 4.917. Uh, sigma squared itself. Four point eight two, so it's fairly close. That's good. So what that's saying is that my estimator seems to be in a good, doing a good job of estimating sigma squared. Now, of course, we expect that because we know, you know, one can actually sh show, you know, the expected value of t is actually equal to sigma squared. I picked this example on purpose because we know what the result should be. That's always a nice way to begin Monte Carlo simulation. Here's another way that you could have went about um, uh, uh, calculating all these values of t. And this should take just as long as the apply function. The first thing I'm going to, it's just not, not necessarily as efficient in terms of the amount of code that you have to write. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is create a vector that I can save all my t's in. So I'm going to say numeric length equal r. And what that's going to do is create a vector length 500 that has zeros in it. I'm going to put that into something called t.all2. And then I do my loop. 4 r and 1 to r. I'm going to calculate the variance every single time. I'm going to put the results into t.all2, where I'm going to put in the rth element. Let's go ahead and do that. 
And so again, if I do mean t dot all two, guess what? I got exactly the same thing as before. Now the apply function, I guess you could say, is the slickest way to do it because it takes less time. But in more complicated data structures, you're not going to be able to use the apply function very efficiently. And so in those cases, it's probably easier just simply to write a for loop. If you do a Google search on which is faster, the apply function or the for loop, you will get some people who would tell you, oh, the apply function is quicker. That is actually incorrect. They both, generally speaking, should take just about the same amount of time. The reason why some people will say the apply function is quicker is uh, more so because of what was in the past when apply was quicker, primarily with S. Uh, S plus had a problem where it had what was called a memory leak uh, uh, when you're dealing with for loops, and that would, would cause for loops to be slower than using the apply function. Um, and unfortunately, you still see through Google search some people say, yeah, the apply function um, is faster. In fact, it was probably about four or five years ago when I first saw that, oh, for loops just as quick. I've always been taught the apply was what was the uh, what was the faster route because I grew up on S plus. Um, okay, so let's see here. Let me go over to page eight of the notes to make sure I'm covering everything that I want to. So. You know, this 4.917 looks kind of close to 4.821, but someone might say, well, how, how, do you do, how do you say that it's close enough? Okay, let's look at uh, two ways to make that determination. First way is not in the notes, it's more of an intuitive way. So what I could do is, instead of looking at the absolute difference, look at the relative difference. So I could do, let's see now, 4. Oops. 4.917 minus uh, 4.825 divided by 4.825. There's only about a 2% difference. That's not that much. 2% you know, is really not a whole lot. Another thing, so that's not on the notes. Another thing that you could do is simply, how about we calculate a confidence interval for me? After all, you know, what are, what are we do what are we doing with the, the average of all these t's? Well, that's a mean. And I have a large sample size. So you go back to your very, very first stat course where you learned about a t distribution uh, base interval for a mean and simply apply that here. You get a confidence interval. So that's what I did. So I take the mean of all my t's plus my value for my uh, my uh, uh, the quantile from the t distribution. Uh, notice that this value from the my, my implementation of, the, of this code for the t distribution actually gives me two values at the same time. Just taking advantage of the vector way that R does its calculations. Take it times the standard deviation of all the t's and divided by square root of the sample size, which is R. So do that. And I get 4.69 to 5.14. So what is this trying to do? What it's trying to do is give you a confidence interval for essentially the expected value of t, right? Now notice sigma squared for us happens to be in that interval. So because of that, you know, I feel very good that t is doing what it's supposed to be doing. Suppose you weren't really satisfied with the width of that interval, what would you do? Suppose you think it's too wide. You know, you really want to maybe a lot more narrower intervals so that you have a better idea so that you can detect smaller differences that might occur, smaller biases that might occur. What could you do to make this interval sh uh, shorter in width? Increase, Increase the sample size. Well, let's think of it in terms of the simulations. Increase the number of simulation runs. That's just what I want to make sure you, you realize that. So, you know, if you're not satisfied with that, you know, try more runs. Okay? You're going to get a tighter interval. You, know, you have that under your control. It's you're the one who's doing the Monte Carlo simulation. Okay. 
Okay, so let's go to page nine. Okay, similar to what we just talked about a few minutes ago, we know that if y has a normal distribution, m minus 1 times t divided by sigma squared has a chi-squared chi distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. Uh, equivalently, hopefully this is taught in set 883, now you know that uh, chi-squared is a special case of a gamma, and you, know, you can work with the scale parameter of the gamma, for example, and show that t actually has a gamma distribution with the alpha parameter n minus 1 divided by 2, the beta parameter 2 sigma squared divided by n minus 1. Did you ever talk about that in 883? Okay, good. Um, so the reason why I did that is because now we compare um, this true gamma distribution to what we are getting with the EDF for T. Now before we actually do the EDF for T, I want to make sure um, uh, that you see the EDF in a very, very simple case. So this is not in the notes. Okay, so let's say that we have a very simple data set here. Uh, sample size is six. Uh, first value is one, second value is two, third value is two, 1.5, three, and four. Okay, so that's going to go into my x. And then to do the EDF, I'm going to use a function called plot dot ECDF. So R likes to put in the C there to emphasize cumulative. Uh, most people just call it EDF. And so R is going to do the plotting for me of, of an EDF. In the first argument, simply X. I put in my data there. I'll explain what the other options are shortly. And so this is my EDF. So there's actually a particular name that we often refer to uh, plots of functions like this. Does anyone know what that name is? It's a step function because it looks like uh, steps. Um, so note with my data, I have one, the lowest value is one. And so, actually, copy and paste this over in Word so I can draw on it. Okay. There's my EDF. So the lowest value in my sample was 1. And so that's why then the EDF, you know, prior to 1, let's say f of 0, it's going to be 0, f hat 0 f hat of uh, 0.5 is going to be 0. And then once I hit 1, then I go up how far? 1.6. So about 0.1667. Okay? So I have six observations. And then my next largest value is 1.5. So between 1 and 1 1.5, I'm still constant here. Then once I hit 1.5, I take another jump up to one-third. At 2, remember I have two values there. So that means now I'm up to 4 6. At 3, I have one value. So now I'm 5 6. And then the largest value in my sample was 4. So now I'm at 6 6. So that's how that EDF works. It's a step function. Any questions about that? So this is essentially an estimate of a cumulative distribution function. So it basically gives you relative frequencies. Cumulative relative frequencies. Okay. So now there were some options in this plot.ecdf function we need to discuss. Let's actually remove these. Line width uh, 2, just to make sure it stands out. I'm going to draw some grid lines, x-axis, y-axis labels, red, no title. And so let's actually draw it like this first. This is the default, but with my extra coloring and other stuff like that. Um, I don't think that really looks, even mo nobody's going to draw an EDF like that. So that's why I add some additional um, arguments. So the verticals equal true 
what that's going to do is uh, draw these vertical lines there. And the do.p stands for do points. The, the, the default is true. I want false. So when I do false, you won't see these red points there. And you'll get what people normally draw as a as an EDF. Okay, so let's come back over here. So I'm going to do now an EDF of all my T's that I simulated. Um, I'm going to open up a graphics window that's kind of wide. Uh, does everyone know what this par statement does? Everyone comfortable with it? You need to explain. Okay, silence means everyone's okay with it. And then I'm going to do my plot. And there's my EDF. So you don't necessarily see the, ste the, the steps as we did before because I have a much larger sample size. Now, if someone showed you that and asked you, so does that look like a gamma distribution, what would you say? I don't know. <laughs> you can't just really, I don't think any of us could really tell just from looking at that CDF, oh yeah, that looks gamma. Unlike if we were to, let's say, do a plot of um, the estimated PDF, for example. So, um, let's actually get then the gamma distribution on there, uh, the CDF. I'm going to use the curve function. Is everyone comfortable using the curve function? Or would you like me to explain this? Okay, thank you. So the curve function is a simple little function in R uh, that allows you to draw curves. Get to my R window. There we go. Uh, or allows you to draw functions of one variable. So let's say I want a, a graph of f of x is equal to x squared. Curve. And then the first argument's expression for expr. And this is where I put in x squared. So I say x caret sign 2. And let's say that I want to see this plot from, uh, let's say, negative 2 to 3. So I use my excellent argument like you would do normally with the plot function. And let me go over here. And there on the right-hand side, you can see my plot of f of x equal to x squared. The key thing is, if let's say if I wanted f of y is equal to y squared. The key thing is, since we're doing stuff with the x-axis, you always have to have an x there. So whatever your equation is, whatever it's a function of, you have to use x in the curve function. <coughs> so to use a curve function then to plot my, my, uh, my CDF, P gamma is going to give me my probabilities. So it's going to give me my CDF itself. And my quantiles that I want to draw at correspond to my x argument. So what R is going to actually do by default, it's going to put 101 values of x equally spaced between, um, uh, let me actually start this again. It's going to put 101 different values of x in that p gamma function between the far left side of your plot to the far right side of your plot. Uh, where I put my shape parameter, that's my alpha, my beta is my scale parameter. I'm going to add the CDF plot to the curve plot. Color blue to differentiate it. Line with two. We're going to put a nice little legend on everything. And this is what we get. So, what do you think? Do you think uh, T has a gamma distribution? Yeah. Very, very close. Good question. Uh, is there an advantage of using gamma instead of y squared? Well, I'm only interested in T itself. That's why. So yeah, very, very little difference. I'm satisfied with the gamma distribution for T. Uh, let's actually do a histogram as well. So I'm going to do a histogram using a his function of all my T's. Now I'm going to do freak equal false. They want to remember why or know why I need to do freak equal false versus the default freak equal true. Freak equal true is plots the frequencies. Yeah. I don't want frequencies. 
I want the y-axis to rescale so I can put a PDF on top of it. Um, so let's go ahead and do that. And there's my histogram right there. And so now I'm going to plot then uh, the, the gamma PDF. So again, I use curve. This time, I want the density function plotted. So I do D gamma instead of uh, P gamma as before. Uh, and then if you look in the help for, for D gamma, you know that the X arguments corresponds to the F of X, the X of F of X. I'm going to add it to the current plot. So I say add equal true, and then I plot it. And there we go. So what do you think? Do you think it looks like a gamma? Yeah. But, you know, I, I have to admit that, especially people who are not necessarily as experienced with statistics as what you guys are, let's say you're studying 218 students, you know, they might be really picky and say, well, geez, these bars don't go all the way up. Or, you know, well, look at it. I have, a, I have a little red bar here, but look at where my blue line is. And so that's why I think looking at the CDF and EDF point of view, is a, is a little bit better because it puts in a scale that we're used to seeing, probabilities. Because I know if you look at where my mouse is, I know this little small difference that we have up here is not really worthwhile to worry about. Very small. What's this, where's the small difference created? Right here. Oops. Actually, it's right here. Okay. And so especially if you're not used to looking at EDF plots, looking at a histogram too can help you relate what you would maybe have seen in your first stat course to what is a better way to typically look at these. Another thing that one could have done is a QQ plot as well. Um, let's keep on going here. This is probably overkill, but I want to go through this uh, because we will consistently do this stuff. Uh, for the next uh, few weeks. Let's say that I want to actually look at the actual quantiles uh, from my distribution for t and compare it to that gamma distribution. Um, obviously my plot did, did all possible quantiles, but at times you might just want to look at specific quantiles. So let's look at how we can do this. <coughs> These are the probabilities corresponding to the quantiles that I want. You know, I chose look, quite low probabilities and quite high probabilities because, you know, often, let's say if we're doing confidence intervals, we will want the low ones and the high ones. You know, any kind of confidence interval you do, you typically you, you get those extreme quantiles from a distribution. Then I put 0.5 in there so we can see the mean. That seems like an interesting thing to do. So, to do... To, the quickest way to get a quantile out in R is to use a quantile function. So I'm going to get estimated quantiles here. So the estimated quantiles for the, uh, or I should say, quantiles for the distribution of T on estimating with these 500 simulated values. So X is all my 500 simulated values. Probs argument corresponds to the probabilities for the quantiles. And type equal 1. There are actually nine different ways in R that you can get quantiles. Uh, in case you're really bored someday, you can take a look at them and see their differences. Uh, as you might expect, as n gets big, all the quantile methods typically give you about the same result. We're going to always use in this class type equal 1, and the reason is because it simply gives you the inverse of an EDF. Exactly. So that's why I like to use it. So let's go ahead and do that. If I do quant.est, you can see my corresponding quantile. So the 0.975 quantile from the distribution of t is estimated to be 11.05. Let's compare that to what the actual gamma quantiles would be. So I use the q gamma function to do that, quantile gamma. Then I'm put everything in a nice little data frame to print it off. And here we go. So we can see, I can just come on over here to work, I can write on it. So we can see definitely for the, the median here, the two are just about the same. And you know, 
on the, the edges or the tails of the distribution, you can see that they're, they're very similar, which is again what we would expect. Now notice that as we're getting farther away from the median, what's happening to these quantiles comparing the two distributions? Are they more similar or less similar? Less similar. Okay. This is actually, we know for a fact, this is not something that we should be worried about because we know the exact distribution of T. It is gamma. But, you know, think of a statistical research setting where you don't know that. And you're seeing, oh, there's a little bit more deviation as you tend to go out. What could be a cause of that deviation? I can think of two. One's something to worry about, and one's not something to worry about. Well, something to worry about is that T doesn't have a gamma distribution, but we know that's not, not, not true. Okay? What could be another cause for seeing differences out in the tail, tails of a distribution? A simulated distribution versus the actual distribution. When we know that uh, we are essentially simulating data so that we should have the exact same, the, ex the, the exact distribution. How about the value of r? Let's say that you took r to be 10. Where do you think the biggest deviations, if there were any, the biggest deviations between the estimated, or let's call it the simulated, the simulated distribution versus the true distribution. Where do you think those differences would occur most? In the middle or on the edges, the tails? Let's draw out a gamma distribution. If I took a sample size of 10, Y'all might expect to see something like this. I'm not going to actually count 10. I might might be a little bit higher than 10 or lower than 10, but I think you get the idea. So the x's represent the observations. Okay. Where do I have my most of my information? In the middle or the tails? Mm -hmm. The middle. So where do you think you're going to do a better job of estimating? In the middle. So you should expect. When you're trying to estimate extreme quantiles, you should expect um, you're not going to have as much information out there when you have a fixed R. So your estimates are probably not going to be as good on the extremes than they will be in the middle. What could you do to fix that problem? Increase R. Remember, you have that under your control. So if your research says, I need to have some really good estimates of quantiles in this extreme portion of my distribution, then you better take a, a large R. R5 equal 500? Yeah, that's kind of borderline there. You know, you know, where are places where you are going to need to get extreme quantiles? Suppose you are developing a new confidence interval. And you know with confidence intervals, typically you find extreme quantiles of a distribution. So if you want that, that um, uh, those quantiles that you're estimating to be good, well, you better take a large enough R. One of the reasons why I bring this up is because when we do the bootstrap section, we are going to be consistently using Monte Carlo simulation to get these extreme quantiles. And you better take a sufficient R if you want that... Uh, a good interval. Uh, maybe it's a little bit tough to see 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 it in right now, but uh, uh, trust me. Rewatch this video. Hopefully, you can download it. Rewatch this video after a few weeks, and you'll be saying, "Oh yeah, now I know what Chris was talking about." Now, there's one little uh, other cool aspect of this ECDF function. Um, if I let's say use ECDF with all my T's, 
And instead of, let's say, printing the, uh, or creating the graph, notice I don't have any options there at all. I just put everything into f.hat. Now I can use that f.hat in a very similar manner to what you could with, let's say, like the p gamma function or the p norm function or any p function, where now I just simply put the quantiles of interest. These are actually the quantiles that we have found uh, previously. Put them in there, and you get probability value. You see some small differences there from, from what the actual true probabilities are, and this is just due to the disc discontinuities in the, in the, e, the EDF um, function itself. Any questions? Okay. So, the first big thing that you often do in statistical research um, with Monte Carlo simulation studies is that you want to make sure that your, your estimator is good. I Meaning it's estimating, let's say, theta correctly. And so we've talked about a way to make that judgment. Um, and then we also looked at the actual distribution, too, of, of, of the estimator. Now, a second thing that you often do with, with, in terms of statistical research and Monte Carlo simulation studies is to examine the true confidence level or coverage of a confidence level. I wouldn't be surprised if some of you, uh, or most of you, I should say, um, have done this before, at least in a limited um, sense. Um, so, if I say I have a 95% confidence interval, I might not truly have a 95% confidence level. So the stated confidence level could be 95%. But my true confidence level might not be. So, you know, for example, in a confidence interval for a mean, you know, the usual old formula that we actually just applied, you know, this is a 1 minus alpha times 100% confidence interval for the mean. Just because I say it's that doesn't mean it's truly that level. And so what we're going to be doing is looking at how Monte Carlo simulation can estimate the true confidence level. And again, people often refer to the the, the true confidence level also with the word coverage, because you're looking at how often does the confidence interval cover or contain uh, the parameter of interest. So, so how do we use Monte Carlo simulation for this? Again, I expect maybe this is review for some of you, but maybe not necessarily put into this kind of a context before. Um, now, the confidence level for a confidence interval. To understand that, you have to understand what frequentist-based inference is all about. Frequentist-based inference is based upon uh, the hypothetical setting of going out and taking a sample, calculating your statistics, calculating the confidence interval. Go out, take another sample, repeat that process, get your confidence interval. Do that a whole bunch of times. And what the confidence level means is that you would expect that 1 minus alpha times 100% of the time, those intervals will actually contain the parameter of interest. That's what frequentist inference is centered on. We can basically now replicate that hypothetical process through using a computer via Monte Carlo simulation. So to get at the true confidence level, we can do the following. So step one, simulate our data sets under the same conditions where the parameter of interest Say theta is no. Step two, calculate the confidence interval for every single one of those data sets. Step three, well, actually look, is my parameter of interest inside my confidence interval? Step four, find the proportion of times that the parameter is inside that confidence interval. And so what we're doing is this. We're calculating an indicator function for every single data set. This indicator function is equal to a 1 if the confidence interval contains uh, the parameter. 
it's equal to zero if it's not. We average all those indicator functions across all R, capital R, simulated data sets. And that is, to make sure you under, make sure you realize this, is the estimated true confidence level. In a statistical research setting, if you want to show your interval that you're proposing works, you know, you would hope that this proportion that you're getting is approximately 1 minus alpha times 100%. Now notice that this indicator function is essentially what I define about page 3, page 4 of the notes as g of t. That's all it is. Some function of t, your statistical of interest. And so, please make that small little change there that I've denoted in blue. So what this quantity, this, this average value is estimating is the expected value of my indicator function. That is the true confidence level. My simulated version includes our simulated data sets. That's the estimated true confidence level. The actual true confidence level is essentially the interval. Yeah. So it's the fraction that we're taking out the R? Yeah. course. If R is large, we know that our estimate is going to be a good estimate of the true confidence level. And again, you have that under your control. So, true confidence level, that's a big thing that you typically look at in statistical research. Another thing that you often look at is in this, expected length. Because not only do we want a confidence interval that um, uh, where the true confidence level is approximately equal to the stated level, we also want an interval that is as short as possible. So, what we can do now is use my g of t function simply to be the upper bound of the interval, it's subtract off the lower bound of, of, of the interval. Calculate that for every single simulated data set, and now you get an estimate of the expected length of the interval. So often you're faced then with the situation of you not, are ju not just doing these calculations for one interval, but maybe four or five intervals. And you want to determine, well, which of these intervals is the best. The best one has a true confidence level, again, closest to the stated, with my south times 100% confidence level, and also has the shortest expected length of all those intervals. Most often, though, no, I guess it depends upon how many intervals you're examining, how many different kinds of intervals. But very often, you know, you're not going to find necessarily one interval that's always the shortest in length, but yet has a true confidence level of you know, one minus half times one hundred percent. So when that happens, then you should put more priority on that one. You want to at least know that that is satisfied. That if I say I have a 95% interval, that it is approximately 95%. Once you know for sure you got that satisfied, uh, then look at all the other intervals that also satisfy it and look at their expected lengths. And from that, make a judgment of, well, which ones may be better. Okay. So, in addition to confidence intervals, of course, you could be doing hypothesis tests. So I guess the third main thing that you typically see Monte Carlo simulation uh, used for in a statistical research paper is to deal dealing with the size of the test, meaning what's the essentially the type one error, the true type one error rate, and what is the power of the test. So uh, it's very similar to what we just got done talking about. Uh, you know, if I state I have alpha 0 0.05 for a hypothesis test of my type 1 error rate, rarely will the actual size of the test 
the, S, uh, the, the, the true type 1 error rate rarely will it be 0 0.05. And so then we go back to, well, what does frequency-based inference mean? Well, it just means that if I were to repeat this hypothesis testing procedure over and over and over again from many, many different data sets, I should get 5% reject when, in fact, HO is true. And so we can simulate that process then using a computer. So to estimate the size using Monte Carlo simulation, let's simulate our data sets under the same conditions where the parameter of interest, say theta, is known. And this is very critical, of course, to no hypothesis is true. So you have to make sure any simulated data set you have that the null hypothesis being true. Then calculate the p-value for each data set. Step three, determine if the p-value is less than the state of value of alpha. And then lastly, estimate the true size where you're taking the average of these indicator functions again, where these indicator functions are simply indicator functions equal to 1 if the p-value is less than alpha. It is equal to 0 if the p-value is greater than or equal to 1. Do you do a lot of these simulations in STET 971? Yeah. Now, uh, I know a, a big thing of Walt's group is power. And so now, you could do an examination of the estimated, or you could, uh, you could estimate the power of a hypothesis test by, instead of simulating under the null hypothesis, the data, you know, have the, the data be under the alternative. Then when you're evaluating a number of hypothesis testing uh, procedures, the one that's best is the one that has a true size closest to the state, say the alpha level, and then also has the largest power. The key is, this first one is the most important. You need to make sure that your test actually does have the correct size, meaning the, the size is equal to alpha, or close to alpha. Once you find that, then you can look at all the procedures that where that's satisfied and look at which one has the largest power. Because you might have a particular procedure that has, let's say, the largest power of all of them, but yet doesn't hold the correct size. Well. Why does it have the largest power? It's because it's rejecting too often. That's why uh, it's rejecting too often even when HO is true. That's why it has the largest power, and you wouldn't want to use a procedure uh, that gave you that. Okay, so let's uh, take, take a look at now um, some terminology. So the, the term conservative and liberal are often, those terms are often used with respect to statistical inference. A conservative confidence interval is one that when the true, let's say, I'm sorry, when the stated confidence level is 95%, the true confidence level is actually greater than 95%. That's a conservative interval. A liberal interval is one that when you say you're, you have a 95% stated confidence level, but in fact, the true confidence level is less than 95%. Maybe 80%. Okay. That's a liberal interval. In most situations, one will always prefer a conservative over a liberal. And that, uh, that just gets into the basic ideas of what we do in science. You know, uh, you, you, you approach scientific discoveries in a conservative manner because you don't want to find out later, in fact, that you were wrong. So that's why we prefer, prefer conservative intervals over liberal ones. Now, some people, unfortunately, will um, um, mistaken what conservative and liberal means in terms of confidence levels. They might say that a conservative interval is one that is wide. A liberal interval is one that is too narrow. That's not necessarily true. Okay? With the width of the interval does not imply uh, if it's conservative or if it is liberal. Oftentimes, though, the conservativeness of an interval is caused by an interval being too wide or being really wide. 
you can think of it this way. If the, the, the wider the interval, the, you can say the largest, oh, you think in a Bayesian context, the larger the probability that, that one interval will contain theta, the wider it is. Yes, wide intervals can cause conservativeness, but they don't have to. You imagine if you have a wide interval that is not centered properly. Maybe it's wide for a large number of values that are above your theta that you're interested in. Well, yeah, it's wide. You can't call it conservative because it's probably missing theta too often. A liberal interval, then, um, or I should say, uh, a, a narrow and length interval, that narrowness often causes liberalness, meaning you have a true confidence level that's less than the stated, but it does not necessarily imply that that will happen. For similar reasons I just got them talking about with respect to conservativeness. Um, I, at least in my other classes, when I bring up conservative and liberal, I often will have some student in the back say, wait a second, you know, uh, my, my advisor told me that conservative and liberal means this. No, it doesn't. Okay. This, the width of the interval can cause liberalness, can cause conservativeness, but it's not necessarily the same as it. Then in hypothesis testing, then, a procedure can be conservative when it rejects less than um, uh, less than 100 percent, uh, 100 times alpha percent of the time. A liberal hypothesis test rejects too often when the null hypothesis is true. Okay, so let's take a look at an example. So we're going to continue with this Monte Carlo simulation for a variance example uh, throughout uh, this set of notes. And what we're going to do is evaluate two different confidence interval procedures. The first one I would imagine that you've all seen before. The second one I won't be surprised if you have not. So often in like a STAT 801 class, you will type of class, you will learn about the normal base confidence interval for a variance. Uh, so it starts off with the assumption that y is distributed normal by ID. And uh, we've already talked about this, kind of. We know that n minus 1 uh, times t divided by sigma squared has a chi squared distribution to it. So because of that, we can write out expressions like this, kind of, if I can fit it all in. So that n minus 1 times t divided by sigma squared is in the middle. Why not pull that one? Excuse me? Why did n minus 1 pull this? I'm, I'm sorry. I mean, why do you have one down to the left and one to the right? What I have there will be less than or equal to yes. 1 minus alpha? Yes. But no, why you have? Why are the inequalities strict? What's the probability that you'll be exactly equal? Zero. Okay, that's why it doesn't matter. Um, so this probability here is equal to one minus alpha. Exactly. Doesn't matter what my sample size is, as long as y is distributed normal, which of course has continuous distribution. Um, so I could I could I could do some rearranging of terms inside that probability statement there, and then substitute the um, uh, the observed uh, value of t into it, and here is my old confidence interval. Okay. We would say that's a 1 minus alpha times 100 percent confidence interval. Here's the second interval. This is called the asymptotic interval. Has anyone by chance ever encountered the asymptotic interval for sigma squared? By chance, talk about this in step 980. Um, so, if you're using the central limit theorem and the multivariate delta method, one can derive this expression. 
the square root of n times t minus sigma squared converges in distribution to a normal random variable that has a mean of 0 and a variance that's equal to the fourth central moment minus sigma squared squared. If you really want to see it, uh, take a look at the Ferguson report on uh, large sample theory. Now, we have then a probability expression. This is kind of expected. This isn't really talked about, unfortunately, in like a course like SET 980. Let's briefly talk about um, how we can put this to use. Make sure you see. Okay. So I took that variance that was on the right-hand side of the expression, moved it over to the left-hand side, and then I basically made the same kind of probability statement that we had done before with the chi-squared stuff. I have an approximate 1 minus alpha in there because this is for a large sample. This works out. Okay. Now, let's focus on this mu4 minus sigma to the fourth power. Using that right there, you can find what's called the asymptotic variance for, uh, uh, for, yeah, yeah, for the square root of n t minus sigma squared. So in other words, So the AS there stands for asymptotic. You can work with the variance just like you would normally with instead of 82. So what happens to that sigma squared that's in here? Why don't you see it down here now? Because the variance of a constant is zero. So that disappears. What happens to the square root of n? You pull it out just like what you would do normally. Okay? So, actually, so the asymptotic variance of square root of n times t minus sigma squared is equal to mu to the fourth minus sigma to the fourth. Then since what I'm really concerned about is the variance for t itself, then you can see that the square root of n ends up being pulled out and then brought over to the other side. So that's why you have a 1 over n there. Clear. So you see this a lot in statistics, and especially students that are new to this will often forget this part right there. That's one over n. Then the estimated asymptotic variance, then, notice how I put a hat on it. I just simply put estimates of all the parameters in there. So the estimate of the fourth moment is just simply kind of like what you would expect, 1 over n times the sum i, y i minus y bar to the fourth. If, you're not, if that's not totally clear, think of it this way. What would be a, what would be a moment base estimate of sigma squared? You know, 1 over n times the sum y i minus y bar squared. If you remember, this is the, the second central moment. Now you might be thinking, okay, why do I have an n there instead of a one uh, instead of n minus one? Well, if I put n minus one in there, I get the unbiased estimator. But still, this can be used as an estimator too. We just prefer the unbiased. So my estimate of that fourth moment then goes in there, and then remember sigma squared is estimated by t, so that's why you see a t squared there. Now n with this. 
Once I put then this estimated variance, essentially in that probability statement that I had above, I do some pivoting and do some nice little algebra there. And this is my confidence interval, uh, my asymptotic confidence interval for a sigma squared. Do note that there are extreme situations where that variance will actually be um, um, negative. Okay, we are out of time. Are there any questions? Okay, and that will be.